Merry Christmas. We are in the season of Christmas. Christmas, the stores may tell us is, it's over, but actually it's just in the midst of the season for believers in Jesus Christ. You've heard of the 12 days of Christmas. We're in the midst of the 12 days of Christmas. Christmas Day is the beginning of the Feast of Christmas. And today we will celebrate the feast together as the family of God. We also wanted to celebrate communion today as it is the last day of the calendar year. We thought it would be a very special way of marking the end of 2017, looking forward to 2018. Next, next week, when we have two services again at 9 and 11 o'clock, uh, we will also have communion as the first Sunday of January, the first Sunday in the new year. But we wanted today, December 31st, to be a day of reflection, looking back and looking forward as we gather together in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We welcome all of you this morning. Uh, welcome to those of you who may be visiting. Uh, we know many of you have traveled here for the holidays to celebrate with family or other special celebrations. And so we give thanks for your presence here today. We hope you find the peace of God in this place and that we hope all of you get a chance to greet one another after the service. Please just give a warm smile to the people sitting around you right now as you pass the friendship pads down the row in which you're sitting. Now as you're doing that, I want to acknowledge that the sky is not falling when you did not get a bulletin when you walked in this morning, okay? It's amazing how little changes really can, can change us, right? Well, actually, we decided uh, to do this for a couple reasons, and no, it's not because we ran out of money at the end of the year and couldn't print them. <laughs> actually, it's, first of all, we did want to give our staff and our faithful volunteers a well-deserved break and time off during this Christmas week of preparing the extra bulletins. Also, and more importantly, in this service this morning where we're going to keep it very simple, very contemplative and reflective, we wanted just to challenge all of us to be able to completely enter into worship without always glancing down to see what's coming next. It's going to be a very simple order. We'll begin with some singing, uh, some music, and then we'll have our opportunity to give to God and to thank God for all of his blessings through our offering. I'll offer a short reflection and some prayer together as a church family, and then that will lead us into the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And uh, as we always mention, all who trust in Jesus Christ are invited to participate in communion this morning. You don't need to be a member of this church. Just uh, know that if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you are part of the family of God. We are here in the Christmas season. Oh, by the way, I did want to mention you didn't get the bulletin this morning, but in your pews this morning is the January program guide, Connect, Grow, and Go. And so we invite you to take this home with you, and there are extra copies out at the welcome desk that for you to take home or give to your friends and your neighbors. So you will go home with some piece of paper, be assured this morning. We are in the season of Christmas, so I invite you to stand and let us sing our praise to God as we continue singing some of the carols of Christmas.
hear this prayer. O Lord of peace and hope, we thankfully bring our tithes and offerings as an expression of gratitude for all that you have given to us. We acknowledge that of all the gifts we have ever received, your gift of a babe in a manger is the one that truly matters. This morning, we dedicate ourselves and our offerings to your service in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. My mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. I've been born again, oh, into your family. Your blood flows through my veins, and I'm no longer a slave to fear. child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears were drowned in perfect love. So I can stand and sing. I am a child of God. Oh, yes, I am a child of God. But I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear, no, I am a child of God. I'd like to invite everybody just to sing that last chorus one more time with me. And I'm no longer a slave to fear, I am a child of God. One more time. I'm no longer a slave to fear. No, I'm not. I am a child of God. That's a great invitation to live into that in the new year. 
even if you don't remember the tune, remember the words. I am no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Two important truths there. First of all, I'm no longer a slave to fear. The idea that fear is one of the greatest weapons that's wielded against us and our peace, our joy. We're always afraid of something, aren't we? We've talked about that quite a bit. We talk about that often. So to live into a new resolution to say, I'm no longer a slave to fear. Fear is going to come up. It's bound to happen. It's part of life. But whether we choose to be imprisoned by fear is our choice. And God can give us the strength to say, I am no longer a slave to whatever makes me afraid. And part of what gives us that confidence is the second part of that song. I am a child of God. That is our true identity. And so bless you to live into that identity in the new year. Think of all the names you've been called in your life. Now that may be touching on a very painful wound for some of us. There also are probably some names and titles that we are particularly proud of, but that may not identify us anymore. And how we struggle to live into this post-identity of what we used to be, if it made us feel good, is also a challenge. Our true identity. And the Bible says this over and over again, is we are children of God. We are heirs of the King. So live into that. And this New Year's Eve, it's a great time to reflect on how we are going to live into the new year. It's also a great time to reflect back on the year that is passing. And I think here at Venice Presbyterian Church, we can look back and see the wonderful deeds that God has done again in a calendar year. We had Hurricane Irma, and we and so many others were protected. I'm particularly grateful for Pastor Burke's miraculous health restoration. I'm grateful for all the ways that when we've had one setback, God has continued to provide something new and wonderful for us as a church family. A few weeks ago, our staff gathered for our Christmas lunch, and there were four people around the table who were not with us a year ago. Even as we said goodbye to some wonderful people like Pastor Lynn, who retired in April, we welcomed to our staff our new executive director, Chris O'Brien, our director of communications, Kelly Wensley, of course, Jamal Sarakoki, our minister of music and worship, and Megan Lickleitner, who stepped up and is now working as our financial secretary here at the church. Very grateful. Of course, looking back on this year, we, we remember friends and loved ones who joined the church triumphant. They will not be forgotten. Their love remains a part of this church as they now celebrate Jesus in a more experiential way, fully present before the throne in heaven. We baptized six children this year, six precious ones who have come into the covenant family. And there have been some miracles in our midst. Some of us will remember late in the spring when it looked like the day for hope would not be able to happen. Blessing so many children in our community, but the missions committee of this church stepped up and said, we will not let this die. And BPC, you stepped up in a big way to provide hope for children and families throughout this community. To God be the glory. And of course, we'll also be grateful for just a simple invitation.
this congregation if they wanted to support when our organ broke, a new organ, to God be the glory. That's a miracle of provision, reminding us again, as so many of us, even on the staff and the trustees and the session, spent hours trying to figure out, how are we going to pay for this? Just ask God. You have not because you ask not. And God is faithful. Well, I look back on this year also and I think about the ways I have grown. And I hope you do too. That hopefully in some ways we've grown closer to Jesus this year. We celebrated the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. And this fall we, we once again focused on some of those pillars of our faith, reminding ourselves that, that it's God's grace that comes first and that God gives us the ability just to have this faith to wrap our arms around the grace that is the free gift and that Jesus Christ is in everything we could ever need for our salvation, our life. And then we live by giving God all the glory and by turning to this book, realizing that the scriptures are God's gift to us to give us truth and all we need to live. And then some of you remember last spring when we looked at the feasts of Israel. It was a fascinating study for me, something I had never really delved into as a Christian pastor, looking at our roots in Judaism and how the feasts that had been celebrated for thousands of years foreshadowing the arrival of Israel's Messiah were an unbelievably magnificent plan of God. And reading and learning about these feasts of Israel just reinforced my faith in the God who makes promises and keeps promises. Some of you will remember one of the feasts was the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets is the feast that marks the agricultural harvest. As the trumpets would blow and invite all of the farmers to bring their produce into the storehouse and to celebrate God's provision. Over the years, because this was the time when the harvest came in, that became also the marking of the new economic year for the nation of Israel. And so over time, the Feast of Trumpets came to be called Rosh Hashanah, which today is still celebrated as the Jewish New Year. Now, it's celebrated in the Jewish tradition, of course, in the early fall, but it's still commemorated as the beginning of a new year. And I thought back to the Feast of Trumpets and Rosh Hashanah as we are now upon the beginning of our calendar New Year. And if you remember, Rosh Hashanah was the beginning of ten days that were especially holy in the nation of Israel, culminating in Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement when all the sins would be forgiven for the people, and they would begin again with a new, fresh slate before God. The Jewish New Year, the new year as it was celebrated by our spiritual ancestors, was fundamentally about repentance. And even as many of us make New Year's resolutions, I'd like to suggest another R for us to consider as we begin this new year. In addition to your resolutions, I invite us as God's people to reclaim the heritage of our spiritual ancestors and see the new year as a time, an invitation to repentance. Why do we want to think about that when we're going off to our New Year's Eve parties and watching all the bowl games and having fun? 
Well, you know me, those of you that are part of this church. I am driven by hope and wanting to preach the good news of the gospel and kingdom life. But one of the truths of Scripture is that for us to experience kingdom life that Jesus came to bring, for us to fully realize our identity as being children of God, for us to live with full hope and joy and peace, there is also this intentional invitation that's part of that to recalibrate and not just to live life on cruise control, but to take time, intentional time, to repent. And repent, the biblical word for that, in the New Testament, it's the word metanoia which has this wonderful double meaning of turning towards God, intentionally repositioning your heart to turn towards God. And at the same time you're turning towards God, you are turning away from whatever keeps you from turning towards God. That's the biblical understanding of this term repentance. It's not just wallowing in our sins and our mistakes. It's recognizing how there are things in our life that keep us from being our best in God. And how we can turn from those things and instead turn towards the light of God is the invitation to repentance. And repentance is key in scripture. Jesus began his earthly ministry by saying the first words that Jesus proclaims in the gospel. Repent. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is near. Repent. And the last words that Jesus speaks in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, there are seven letters to the churches. And in those seven letters, seven times, Jesus says, Repent. There's this invitation for us to Bring before God those things that are keeping us from him. And then turning unencumbered by those things that imprison us. Letting those chains go. And running with new vigor and vitality the race that's set before us. Now I know some churches where the leadership of the church as part of their New Year's tradition, all the leaders fast for the first week or so of the New Year as a means of repentance, as a means of seeking God and saying, I'm going to let go of some of the things just that may distract me so I can give special focus to God at the beginning of this year to set a new tone for how I'm going to live in the year to follow, how our church is going to live in the year to follow. We're going to say at the very beginning of the year that we are, first of all, focusing our arrow on God. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. That's the promise of Scripture. And so I invite us this morning, and I invite you even to take the first part of this new year, maybe in the spirit of our Hebrew ancestors to take 10 days and maybe to find something to carve out in your day to turn towards God and to turn away from something that may keep you from God. You know, one of the biblical practices that I humbly admit I just don't preach a lot about is the practice of fasting. Maybe because I enjoy my food so much. <laughs> and sometimes we talk about, well, we'll fast from being critical, or we'll fast from losing our temper, or we'll fast from becoming anxious. And, and those are good things to resolve, but the problem is those things are bound to creep up anyway. I would encourage us, first of all, to think about fasting from something you can control. Like for me, it could be, it, in fact, it will be. I stand before you to say, the first 10 days of this year, I am not going to look at any 
electronic device, computer screen, television after 8 p.m. at night. <laughs> so I have stood here and made my vow. How many of you might want to try that, too? Why do we refrain from things? It's not to punish ourselves. It's to free ourselves for something that may be more life-giving. I dare you. <laughs> Try fasting from something the first 10 days of this year. Set yourself on a course of a new year that may be different. For some of us, the new years just kind of come and go. It's just one thing after the other. And maybe we've even given up on resolutions because we never keep them anyway. May this year be different for you and for this church. Peter, who was someone who changed dramatically in a year. Think about how impetuous Peter who Jesus became quite frustrated with at times, and who even denied knowing Jesus three times on the night when Jesus was tried. A short time later, over that next year, Peter developed into a bold apostle. And in one of his first messages recorded in the book of Acts, he gives us these words that I want to claim for you, for me, and for this church. Peter said, speaking in the temple, Repent, therefore, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, so that times of wonderful refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. That's in Acts 3, verse 19. Repent, therefore. Begin this new year with an attitude of repentance, turning away from the things that keep you from your best, turning towards the light of God. Repent and turn to God so that your sins, and we all have sins, and sins are always going to come upon us even in the new year. We are imperfect people, but those besetting sins that sometimes keep weighing us down, keeping us from our best, keeping us from loving God more fully and following him more nearly, the promise is that as we turn to God and as we repent, they are wiped out. And of course, we know that Jesus has already forgiven us our sins. But Peter is preaching here after the resurrection. And so there's still a place for repentance in the Christian life. It's that recalibration. Repent, therefore. Turn to God so that your sins not may be diminished. Notice what the promise is. They'll be wiped out. So that Wonderful times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And so I invite us to pray as we come to communion this morning. I invite us to pray with thanksgiving for blessings of this past year. I'd like us to pray with hope for the new year. And I'd like us also to pray with a heart of repentance. And just in a few moments of silence, you don't have a bulletin to look at. Just rest. And let God bring to your awareness those places in your life where you want to become more like Jesus Christ. O oh Lord, search us and know us. You do know us completely.
Help us to know ourselves. Sometimes we just mark time without examining our lives. And I thank you for this, this last day of the calendar year where there is sort of that invitation to reflect and to reconsider. And so, Lord, we acknowledge before you the ways that We want to be a truer reflection of our identity as children of the King. And Lord, as we bring to our mind's eye these places in our life, we pray against feelings of guilt or shame. But we do ask for godly sorrow and repentance. Help us to care about the conditions of our hearts and our souls. And Lord, as we turn to you, we pray that what you are doing through the power of your Holy Spirit in each person who's a part of this church would collectively have an amazing impact on the whole community. Lord, we pray for those wonderful times of refreshing to come. And we know that no refreshing, no reawakening, no revival comes without repentance. <clears throat> Lord, hear us in these moments of silence as we give you thanks for the blessings of this year. As we look forward with hope to what you will do in the year ahead. And as we Turn away from that which is not life-giving and turn towards you. communion. I invite us to sing this song together as a prayer for ourselves, for the people you're sitting around, 
for our community. here for the Lord's Supper. As was said earlier by Pastor Chris, all are welcome to the table who believe in Christ as Lord. We will also have gluten-free bread with our servers on both sides. If for any reason you cannot come forward, don't hesitate to raise your hand and our server will bring the elements to you. And we go to God in prayer. Lord of bright and abiding light, you've shown us in the person of Jesus, your Son, a new way to live. As we approach a new year tomorrow, there are those in our midst who struggle with ill health, economic challenges, and broken and damaged relationships. Some struggle with the loss of loved ones, others with anxiety or loneliness. Hold them in your care, O Christ. Let your light shine on all, bringing healing and hope. And as we come to the close of this year, O God, help us to acknowledge 
the prayers that you have answered throughout this year. We give you thanks for the blessings that are ours. Now, gracious Father, we pray that you will pour out your Holy Spirit upon these, your gifts of bread and cup. And through them, send us out in the power of your Spirit to live for others as Christ lives for us. As we worship together on this New Year's Eve, we pray the prayer that Jesus gave to his followers centuries ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth. Give us Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. And in like manner, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had supped, gave thanks and gave it to his disciples, saying, Partake of this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant given for you for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as we partake of this bread and cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again.
Let us pray. Loving God, you have graciously fed us with the bread and the cup. May we who have received this sacrament be strengthened in your service and let us, our lives be a thank offering to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. May we join our voices together in the closing hymn. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy, be glory and mercy, dominion and power, both now and now.